Good evening, guys. Uh, my name is Travis. Um, I've been in court tonight about radicalisation uh, and extremism. This is something that uh, I feel very passionate about personally because of an experience I had a few years ago that, for lack of a better phrase, changed my life. So, as we get into things, um, usually I say try not to quote me on anything that's said unless you ask me, but I don't mind. Whatever is whatever said, you know, it's sort of between us anyway, so if you want to share anything, that's not a problem at all. And the other thing I'd say is ask me anything. Um, I must admit, Fahim has really bigged you guys up before this, um, so no pressure. Uh, he's banging on about how much you all stick your hands up on things and you all talk, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm not going to put off so you stick your hand up at any time, and certainly there's Q&A a bit at the end, but um, more than welcome to just stick your hand up anywhere, any point in the presentation. And I won't be offended either. Um, an open book, and if you have any questions about you know, what happened to me or about the stuff we're discussing, I'm happy to answer anything. With that in mind, let's keep in mind throughout all this that the goal of this talk, first and foremost, is keeping people safe. Um, you know, what happened to me wasn't inevitable, and at some point in the, the man's life who carried out that attack, he was radicalised. Um, and for the rest of his family's lives, for the rest of my life and the lives of everyone else who was in that attack, we've got to put up with the consequences of his actions. And I think that's what we all need to keep in mind today. So, before we get started into the floor things, you've got the post-it notes in front of you. If you can just sort of take the top half of the post-it note and just write on, because no matter what it is, write on what your understanding of extremism is before we've even started. Just to give us an idea. If you keep writing down on the post-it notes, uh, I'm just seeing your sharing pens, it might take a little while. And we'll crack on anyway, um, but just feel free to carry on while I'm talking. So, kick things off. And I think it's probably worthwhile if I talk a little bit about um, what happened to me or why I'm in front of you all today. Um, I mean, it'd just be interesting. I forgot to ask Fahim actually, how old are you guys in the room on average? You all probably the same age? 17. 17. 16. 16. 16. Okay, yeah, so you must, yeah. Okay. So, when the attack happened, I was 19 years old. Um, that's, that's not too far off you guys. And, um, I just started university, uh, finished my A levels, uh, applied to uni. Uh, big thing I wanted to be as corny as I wanted to be a history teacher for ages, um, and uh, headed off to uni to study history. Um, now I was halfway through my first uh, year at university, about six months in, and it was March 2017, and we were given an opportunity to travel down to London. Uh, now, I'm, as you can probably imagine by the accent, I'm not from London. I'm from Lancashire, and um, hence that's where Edge Hill is as well. And it's three days down in London, um, and it's free, so what more could we complain about? So, myself and a few of the lads on my course all decided to take them up on the offer. We went down to one another, there was a group of about 16 of us, and we ended up getting down there that late on the first day that we missed everything. Um, so, we already had one of the three days gone. So. We get up really early the next day, and we have to go straight into, you know, like Parliament and all that side of things. Um, we have a tour, we, I think, met with a couple of MPs and wards and things. And it got to about half two in the afternoon, and we um, essentially were meeting with an MP, and she had to go and run off and vote on something. So we were left with half an hour of free time. And in doing so, I mean, it wasn't enough time to do a, a bit of proper sightseeing, but we did have a bit of free time. So some of the guys went off and uh, went to the House Commons Cafe, went to grab the coffee, um, another group went off shopping, and myself and about four of the lads just decided to get a bit of fresh air. And as you can see on the board, we left uh, Parliament and walked around the corner um, as, as we started to go across Westminster Bridge. We've got a few guys joining us. Um, now, I took a picture of Big Ben on the way out of Parliament, and um, <coughs> I sent it to a friend, and they were texting me asking, essentially, uh, you know, why are you in London, what are you doing down there? So I was replying to them, 
And I like, killed about a third of the way along the bridge um, when one of the other lads in my group shouted, look out, or Travis, look out. And uh, I looked up from my phone um, and the terrorist vehicle was driving towards me. Um, now, the police reckon when he hit me he was driving about 46 miles an hour. But he got up to about 72 miles an hour in total on the bridge at some point. Uh, he was driving a, an SUV, you know, like a 4x4, and he was mounting pavement repeatedly in talking to pedestrians, myself and my friends included. And it happened that quickly that I didn't have time to react. Um, and that's probably actually what saved me, because in doing so, I didn't try jumping out the way, I didn't move, and I was hit head on by the car. Um, as were all my friends. Now, I was thrown over the bonnet because I was on the part of the pavement closest to the road. I was thrown over the bonnet, I hit the windshield of the car, and then I was thrown into the air. And I was in the air for what felt like forever, to be honest with you. I mean, it could have only been a couple of seconds, uh, if that. But I'd been flipped over in mid-air, um, and now, as we were, of course, walking away from Parliament, all I could see was the sky and Big Ben out the corner of my eye. And then I landed back down the concrete. And in doing so, that's actually what caused most of my injuries. Now, the only reason I'm alive, it's pretty clear actually, the doctors were pretty open about this, the only reason I'm alive is because when I landed back down on the concrete, one of the other lads in my group that had already been hit by the car and was led down the ground, when I landed back down, my head landed on his stomach um, and was cushioned. Every other part of my body that hit the concrete was fractured. Um, I fractured my left leg in two places. I uh, broke every single finger on my left hand and the hand itself. And I had uh, lacerations and things like that. And uh, essentially what they were sort of calling a shrapnel wound in my left leg. Now, I wasn't aware of the injuries I sustained at the time. And um, because my head had been cushioned, I actually got up immediately afterwards and sort of in shock or um, you know, like the trauma of it, I just got off and started walking around on the bridge, even though I had this, you know, this leg was broken in two places when it happened. And um, I just remember being in sort of like autopilot mode, this bizarre, um, you know, mode where all I could think about was I needed to cut my phone, because obviously that had been in my hand when I was hit by the car, and I needed to get my shoes, because the car had hit me with that much force, my shoes had literally been thrown off. And uh, it, it seems stupid, you know, looking back actually, but you just can't control what you're thinking in that moment. Um, now I walked up and down the bridge and saw the, you know, the whole range of sort of fatalities and, um, uh, and injuries that have been sustained. Uh, just behind me, slightly to the right, close to the riverside, um, uh, a man has actually proposed to his girlfriend. They were on holiday, they were from Romania. And she was hit by the car and thrown into the Thames and suddenly drowned. And just in front, and to the left of me, was a woman uh, on her way to pick up her kids from school. And she was hit by the car and actually thrown under a double decker bus and killed her. So we were really, you know, smack bang in the middle of this. And uh, it really was sort of roll of the dice that, that we survived. And it was perhaps, um, you know, about 15 minutes after, after I'd been hit by the car that the sort of adrenaline started to run out. And I didn't know what injuries I'd sustained necessarily, but I knew I had to sit down because something was wrong and the pain was starting to kick in. Um, in doing so, one of my friends, who uh, the one I'd actually landed on, had received uh, a laceration to his forehead. He'd been hit by the wingmer of the car. And the blood was running into his eyes and he was, he was starting to panic because he couldn't see. And so we were trying to get something to stem the bleeding, actually, and, you know, something to sort of apply pressure. And I tried taking my coat off and that's when I noticed the injury to my hands. I didn't, I wasn't aware of it before then because I had sort of elasticated sleeves on my coat. And as I tried taking it off, I noticed that each of my fingers on my left hand was pointing in a different direction. Some of them were bent back, some of them were twisted out of place. Each one of them was that badly fractured and mangled that they were pointing in a different direction and I physically couldn't get the coat off. Now, of course, I found out later that the hand itself was broken as well. Um, but it's, you just don't know in that sort of, you know, craziness of the aftermath. Now, as the adrenaline started to run out, the paramedics started arriving. Uh, my mates were taken to a nearby hospital. It was actually a hospital at the other side of the bridge. And uh, they were walked over there uh, because they were classed as walking wounded. 
Whereas I knew by this point I couldn't walk and I had to wait for an ambulance. So I sat with my back against the, you know, the parapet of the bridge and um, it was at this moment that I started to shake and I started to go really pale, um, really started to um, you know, shake uncontrollably, could not sort of understand why. And some of the paramedics that were waiting for a stretcher with me realised that I must have some sort of serious bleed. And so quickly, you know, not knowing where this blood was, was coming from, they started cutting my clothes off to try and work out where the bleed was. Was it internal? Was it external? Had it hit an artery, perhaps? Uh, and if it did, that would have meant I had to get to hospital immediately. And in doing so, I mean, you have to remember, I'm still in the middle of uh, Westminster Bridge here, one of the busiest bridges in London. And there's helicopters flying all over, there's, you know, sirens and stuff. And all the, all the, the cops around me, all the, um, the paramedics, they also go stood around and maybe took the coats off and tried covering up to give me a bit of decency. And they started cutting my clothes off to, to find this bleed. And um, like you're allowed to laugh at this bit because it's stuff like this that I think, you know, you just gotta, you gotta laugh and you'll cry and you gotta find the, the, the funny bits in all of this. They cut my pants off and uh, in doing so, they got to my underwear and it was so red. And one of the paramedics like, looked up at me and I looked at him and I said, just, you know what I mean, just, just do it, go and have a look. So he, so he goes back under the blanket, sort of taking the witness, he's having a look, and he sticks his head up about five, I don't know, maybe 35 seconds later, and he goes, don't worry buddy, the goods are intact. And it's just stuff like that, that's just like, you know, the most bizarre things, in the middle of something so horrific, um, that you can start a laugh. Um, now, what he had found was that I did have a laceration, um, and it was shrapnel from the glass of the car, um, and it had cut into my left leg and just missed the artery. Uh, so I was incredibly lucky again because, of course, if it had nicked the artery, that might have been essentially game over. Um, pretty soon after that, you know, they, they stuffed up the wound, they got me on a stretcher, um, filled me full of drugs and all sorts, and then took me to the hospital. Uh, when I got to the hospital, I had two operations. One of these was done almost immediately afterwards, and that was on the hand because the sort of range of, of injuries that I've had to the hand meant that if I was ever going to have any chance of regaining function, they had to reset each finger individually right there and then. Um, and if you want to imagine how painful that was, each finger was broken and twisted out of place. So they had to move broken fingers into place without pretty much any, any anaesthetic or anything. It was, you know, it was while I was awake. So you can imagine it was literally the most painful thing I've ever experienced. And a couple of days after that, they did an operation on my leg as well. Um, they essentially found that there had been two fractures. One of them needed metal work, and uh, that needed to be put in a couple of days afterwards. So I had a pin and a sort of like small plate put in. And that sort of concluded my time in hospital. So I was eight days. Um, I was discharged, sent back up north, um, spent five months or so on crutches and another month on a walking stick and then roughly about two years in and out of uh, physiotherapy essentially. So it was a very long journey um, and uh, essentially it's what's brought me in front of all of you today. Um, you know I had a lot of time, if nothing else I had a lot of time to think and it was during that time that I thought why is it that quite frankly we're not talking about this. You know it, it's still a bit of a taboo I think even you know in schools and, and colleges and stuff Growing up, like we know about terrorism, we know what extremism is, but do we really think it's going to happen to us? Really? We don't. And I, I mean, I was certainly guilty of that. You know, I, I sort of thought, perhaps subconsciously, this is just something we see on the telly and it's, it affects other people. Um, and that's simply not the case, you know, and I think the nature of extremism, the nature of radicalization means that each and every one of us has to be thinking about these issues, has to be talking about it, if we've got any chance whatsoever to try and beat this sort of thing. And that brings us pretty well into the next slide. Um, this is a little bit of the nitty gritty. I won't spend too much time on it because I know it's probably a little bit boring. But I wanted to say a little bit about the nature of terrorism uh, in the UK at the moment. Now, we hear on the news about like Islamism. Uh, that's essentially like the attack that I was affected by. Um, that's sort of international, religiously motivated, but we also see a lot of, sadly, increasing risk from like far right and neo-Nazi sort of like racists. 
um, extremism. You see that in the US, but sadly it is coming over here as well. And we also see this sort of, at the moment the police are really worried about this mixed, unclear motive. This is people that are just, just angry and just um, fed up with the world. And, you know, I can't blame them, but it's what you do about that. And it's okay to be angry, it's okay to be fed up, but are you using that for good? Are you using that to, to power you on and do something positive? Are you using that to harm people and cause violence? Now, another thing at the end here, what do they actually want to achieve from this? Well, pretty clear, they want to cause us to turn against one another. Um, you know, if, a, if an attack's carried out and let's say it's an Islamist attack and um, white people in an area blame all Muslims then, well that plays right into what they're trying to do because they want to divide us and they want us to blame people who are completely innocent for the things they've been doing. And at the same time, they want to fight against an enemy that they know they can't beat in a fair fight. That's why they're targeting, I mean, look at Manchester, they're targeting women and children. They're going after women and children because they know they can't beat them in a fair fight, so it's cowardice. And on that topic of religion, I think it's worth mentioning uh, while we're here, you know, there is this sort of, I guess, misbelief, and certainly where I live, and sure you guys face it as well, that, you know, religion's to blame for terrorism, and it isn't, full stop. I mean, you could literally read any of the holy books, and you will find lines against violence, against extremism. It's people that use religion as their sort of motivation that are a problem here, and it's the fact that they're using it to try and justify what they're doing, whether that's ISIS trying to use, say, Islam as their sort of motivation, or saying it's their motivation, or whether it's, uh, you know, like nut job sort of crazy Christians in America who live out in the Midwest and have incredibly sort of old-fashioned views about, say, gay people and stuff. Religion isn't the problem here, it's them using it as their motivation. And I guess the question here is how do they do it? And it's all grievances. As I said before, it's all things that, quite frankly, um, you know, we're annoyed about, we're angry about, and rightfully so. It could be, say, racism, could be socioeconomic injustice, lack of education, maybe. But it's what you do with it, and they're exploiting that. They're using that to try and get you on board with their aims, essentially. And often they don't do it alone, you know? They, often we see sort of like uh, extremists who are, um, how should I say, sort of hardened. They know what they're doing. They're not going to carry out the attack themselves. They're going to get someone else to do it. And that's where they try and take advantage of us as young people. And I think that's going to fall in that category a little bit. So, <coughs> to remember throughout all of this, I think, as I said, terrorism can affect any one of us as a victim. Any one of us in this room right now. I mean, I was in your position, you know, not so many years ago. And yet would have never envisaged full stop that when I went to uni on that day, I would have been in a terror attack. But at the same time, actually, any one of us can be at risk of radicalization. You know, this is, this is something that really can affect any of us. And um, we all have to be talking about these issues full stop to be aware of, to educate and know the warning signs and to be able to get friends and family help if they're at risk of it as well. So, Enough of me talking. Um, hope some of you haven't fallen asleep. And I want to do a bit of an activity with you. Now, I mentioned before the fact that this can affect any one of us, whether it's victims, uh, whether it's people being radicalised. Over these next few slides are people I've met uh, over the past couple of years of working in this area. There's this guy, for example. And you'll see throughout all these photos. Some of these people are victims of terrorism, some of them are former extremists, and some of them are, say, like law enforcement or people working in counter terrorism. My question to all of you, considering what we've just said, is which one's which? There's no right or wrong answers here. Well, I guess there is, but nobody's going to be judged for what they say, okay? What do we think? So. Behem's told me that you're all very active, that's what he said. So we'll, we'll test that one. I'm going to say, uh, you know, whether he's a sort of, I'll say a victim or I'll say an extremist. And I want you to stand up if you agree with it. Okay? 
And on, and on. So, let's start things off. So we've got Kaelin. This is Kaelin. If I said to you, um, who thinks that Kaelin is an extremist? Okay, interesting. Have you got that mic? Let's go see what they think. No, no, no. You can't sit down now. It was basically that entire corner of the room. You can't see it now. So, what is it that made you stand up? You can say anything. I think the person you least expect, like, you know, um... For the person you least expect. Interesting. Is there anything, anything about him, anything, you know, that you, you took one look at him and thought, don't like the look of that? I mean, I was speaking at a school on Tuesday, and they all said he was an extremist because they didn't like his glasses. <laughs> what do we think? <laughs> nice glasses, okay. <laughs> what do we think? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you think that Kaelin is a survivor of terrorism? Okay. Does that mean no one, or you just don't want to stand up? And how many of you think Kaelin is law enforcement? Okay. How many of you think he's police? Right, so it's like 90% of you that haven't stood up at all. Is the fourth category? Might be wearing those glasses to prevent people from uh, shooting him. You're know, like uh, a force field that protects him from uh, extremists. Uh, not only stark. I mean, it's a good idea. Well, that's but... an interesting view, isn't it, sir? It is interesting. Yeah. Right, so before we move on to the next one, Kaelin is an extremist, a former extremist. Okay? Not, don't, yeah, don't question yourself, get it right. We can barely see this guy because we're alive, but this is Tom. Okay? Take a look at Tom. How many of you think Tom is uh, like a police or a firefighter? Yeah, interesting. Whoa. Any reason why? Well done. No, I don't know. She's the mean one here. You've got to pick up the line. She's got something to say. <laughs> Hello. What's your name? I mean, basically, I think he look, he's got that kind of intense look. Kind of, so a police officer looking at me. It's pretty cool. I think that's true, actually. Yeah. Anyone else? <coughs> I mean, there was quite a few of you that stood up. Hmm? What do we think? We've got someone here. You've been talking to Nancy. Cashmere. 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 Because he's old and wiser. Okay. Okay, sure. I mean, you can tell what you want. Uh, how many of you think that he is a survivor then? Okay, we're going to do. I saw you, even if she didn't. We've got some over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, why do you think she's a. Uh, why do you think he's a survivor? No, no, no. In the purple. No, you can't work. You can't work on like that, and then not get picked on. Sure. I don't like his eyes. You don't like his eyes. No, I don't like his eyes. Oh, he's nice. No, his eyes. His eyes. What about his eyes? I'm kind of sad. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Does. I was at school on Tuesday, and they all said, well, uh, he must be a survivor because he looks, um, he looks serious. And they said he looks like he's been in a sad documentary. <laughs> so, I don't know what that says about him. But how many of you think then, last category, how many of you think he might be an extremist? You know what? Okay, interesting. So, Tom is a 9-11 survivor, okay? 
What do we think about a map? How many of you think a map is uh, an extremist? What are we thinking, guys? Extremist? Stand up if you think you're an extremist. No one. Oh, we got okay. We'll just couple. That's just oh, we got to use. So, so, how many of you then? That was that wasn't many of you. How many of you think he's a survivor? Okay, interesting. So let me know. That that means then that means everybody else thinks he's law enforcement. So you can ask anyone why they think he's law enforcement. Go and see. <coughs> I don't know if you can put that Okay. Uh, so we're going to buy him physically or just look at him? Okay. Anyone else agree? Disagree? Yeah? What, what is that about him that we think? <laughs> okay, I'll tell him that. Um, <laughs> You gotta say to the crowd now. Come on, guys. Hey, quiet down. Wait, stop at the photos of the survivor and he's like, oh my god, they were so happy and adventurous. Okay. Interesting, because again, I hate to keep saying Tuesday, but on Tuesday, they said they thought he was a terrorist because that's sand behind him. So, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Listen, Whatever we'll come up with. So a man is in fact law enforcement and he works in Camp Terrorism. Yeah. What do you think about that war? How old are you for that? How many of you think how many of you think the Mount War is a survivor? Okay, we've got a few. Oh wow, okay, we've got a few. What is that about him that makes you think he's not a survivor? Okay, yeah, perfect. Hold the mic down, please. I can't lie, bro. That's like an uncle. Like, he's not even like. He's in the trouble. Born to himself. He just can't take life. He's badly in it. He does look like an uncle. I can see that, actually. Yeah. Looks like he make a good brood. Anybody else? What else do we think? Survivor. Shall we move on? How about. How many of you think he's a uh, law enforcement? Or like first responder? Just got one. Okay, interesting. And then finally, then how many of you think that he's uh, an extremist? <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. It's entirely normal. Think anything about him? No. No. You have no thoughts whatsoever. Okay. So none of you think he's an extremist. Okay. So this is Mal War. Uh, Mal War was an extremist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you wait till you lose something. Um, Mamor, uh, Mamor, if we all want to quiet down, guys, Mamor uh, was a foreign fighter to Afghanistan in the 70s and 80s. What do we think about Ali? Who thinks that Ali is for Islamic Who thinks that Ali is for, let's say, a survivor? <laughs> Wait, check it out. Why? Why? I'm gonna hand over to you. Can you just look? Can you look at one? It just looks like Slavia. Any reason or? He likes. Okay. Interesting. Alright. Anybody else agree, disagree with that? He looks sad? No? It looks like a documentary to you. Yeah, they always say that. They always say that. That's true. But then, can you not have a documentary if you're an extremist? Not in the short. I mean, there's that Shamil Big documentary at the moment. What about? I mean, I guess you could have a documentary if you're law enforcement as well. 
How many of you think that, uh, seems to study, how many of you think that Ali is law enforcement? Absolutely. Take it over, part of you. Interesting. <laughs> well then finally, how many of you think Ali is an extremist, or a former extremist, I should say? Interesting. Okay, question time. Let's move on to the next one. So Ali is in fact an FBI agent. What do we think about Alpha? How many of you think that Alpha is a former extremist? What about you in the blue on the end? Any ideas why? Just looks like an extremist. What's an extremist, Robert? You say it, say whatever you want. I don't, I don't know, I just get a vibe. You just get a vibe? Yeah? No, it's alright. Anybody else agree with that? You getting a fully vibe or what do we think? No? Maybe? Okay. Who thinks then that Alpha is, uh, say, like law enforcement? No one. Any reason why you don't think he's law enforcement? No? Well, in that case then, how many of you think that Alpha's a survivor? Yeah. Why? You stick your head down on your wife and still see it. <laughs> Come on, just, just tell us anything. Um... I just think that done it innocently. Okay. okay. Anybody agree with that? Looks innocent? Well, it's very different to the vibe he was getting at the back. You don't think he looks innocent? No? Okay. So, uh, Alpha is in fact a survivor. Uh, he lost his father in an attack in Australia. Now, final page, again, conscious of time. You've got six faces up this time. We're going to do a bit of a quick fire round, okay? Save time before we get towards the end of the uh, session. First one, top left. What do we think about Dot Hill? Let's just uh, let's cut out the standing up and sitting down sort of thing now because push the time. Stick your hand up if you think she's a survivor. Okay. Stick your hand up if you think she's a former extremist. Quite few of you. Stick your hand up if you think she's law enforcement. Wow, that's quite a few, okay. Is there any reason why? I don't think an FBI finished Okay, oh, what the hell, okay. Um, so, Dot is in fact a survivor of the Oklahoma City bombing uh, in 1995. What do we think about the guy in the middle, Joe? What do you think? I heard someone say FBI or something there. You think an FBI? Any reason why? Just the way he's dressed or what? A big well, picture, like a professional photo, you mean? Okay, interesting. Anyone agree with that? Think he's like FBI or something? Okay, it looks like a politician. Who said that? That's an interesting one. Any reason why? Yeah, like with a flag behind him or something. Okay. Um, well, let's take a vote then. How many of you think that Joe is, um, you know, like law enforcement slash first responder? Recent number. How many of you think he's a survivor? And how many of you think he is uh, a former extremist? Quite a few. Any reason why? I'll be honest with you, I went to a school once and they said he looks like a racist. I don't know what he deserved that for, but they said he must be an extremist. He looks, he looks strange. People say the worst things. Well, Joe is in fact a first responder. He is a fire lieutenant. Uh, so not quite FBI, but we still got the category right. What do we think about Sahel, top right? What do we think? So we... Sahel, how many of you think Sahel is a survivor? Quite a few. How many of you think Sahel is uh, a former extremist? Not so many of you. How many think he is law enforcement then? Okay. Yeah. So Sahail, yeah, I know it's like it's like blinded by the line, isn't he? But uh, Sahail is a former extremist. Uh, he was radicalized at 16 years old, and when he got to 18, he nearly carried out an attack um, and was sort of brought back from the brink. Maybe something to think about. 
What do we think about Tony in the bottom left corner here? He's got his book on shore, looking nice and fancy with his boss out. What do we think? Is Tony a former extremist? Yeah. Stick your hand up then if you think he is. He says we're saying yeah. We've got a few of you. Is Tony a survivor? Decent number as well. Is Tony a uh, law enforcement slash first responder? Not many of you. Okay. So Tony is a former extremist. Um, let's go to the middle. We've got Darren. What do we think about Darren? <laughs> Any thoughts? How many of you think that Darren is a survivor? Quite a few. How many of you think that he is a former extremist? Okay. And how many of you think that he is like a law enforcement slash, you know, first responder? Yeah. So, a little bit of a, a hint. Darren, when you know his story, you'll probably see him everywhere. So Darren is a survivor. Uh, when the attack on London Bridge happened, he picked up a normal tusk and started fighting them with it. Uh, so there's a famous picture that was in the newspaper and things of him that's been carrying a giant tusk trying to fight this guy. Final one. What do we think about Mubeen? How many of you think that Mubeen is a former extremist? Okay, just a couple at the back. How many of you think that Mubeen is a survivor? Okay, any reason why? Uh, <laughs> you okay. And how many of you think that Mubeen is law enforcement? Quite a few of you. Any reason why? No? Any reason why? So, Mubeen uh, essentially was a member of Canada's equivalent of MI6, so he is in fact law enforcement. So, let's move swiftly towards the end, because uh, I want to give you a little bit of time for questions. Again, Fahim's picked you all up, he said you all might ask a question, we'll see how that goes. Um, what you can do, let's talk about small steps first. Well, these are pretty obvious, they're kind of soppy, but they're actually true. You'll be a global citizen, meet with people from different communities, cultures, etc., travel whenever you get a chance. Think critically about everything that you hear and read. Don't believe everything, don't take everything at face value that you see in a newspaper or you read on the internet. Probably not true. Think about the impact that you can have on the world. You can genuinely make or break someone's day. Um, and I know which one I prefer it to be. And finally, enjoy life. Uh, so one thing I've always taken forward from all of this is the fact that um, you know the best thing I can do to remember those people who died in a positive light and to remember and to sort of beat terrorism, if you will, is to actually live a good life and show that they didn't beat us, they didn't win. Now, in terms of big steps, if you think either you or someone you, you know or like someone in your community, your friends or family, is at risk of radicalization, first thing, just speak to your teachers. They're gonna know what to do, they're gonna know whether it's a valid concern, um, and they're gonna sign post to what goes next. And the good thing to remember here is if that person gets support that they need early on, they're not going to be punished. Um, they're going to be provided with the support they need to leave that world. And nine times out of ten, the police don't even get involved full stop because it doesn't bother them. They're only going to get involved if there's a risk to or a threat to either that person's life or someone else's life. So if we get them the support they need early on, the police don't even need to know about it. They can carry on living a life completely unbeknownst to everyone else, as you saw from those slides. You know, not a single person in this room got every single person on those slides correct. And it proves the point that you really could walk past any of those people and not know what went on in their life, whether they were previously an extremist and were de-radicalized, whether they were a survivor of a terror attack, whether they worked in law enforcement. And finally, it's pretty obvious, but if you think an attack is imminent, call 999. Uh, the amount of lives that can be saved genuinely from just calling 999 when people think about doing it and then they decide actually I'm going to waste someone's time. You can save lives and just just do it. They're not going to complain if you waste their time. So, just something to think about as we go into the bit of Q&A bit. You've heard from me um, for long enough. You know by now um, everything I've told you on this previous slides. And I guess it's just worth thinking, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to learn more about these issues? Are you going to be more aware of these issues? And it's something to take forward until the end of the session. With that in mind, 
I'll leave it to you for questions. Thanks, guys. So, any questions? So, I've got a question. Sure. Um, if, what, what kind of signs should people look out for if they feel like they're coming into contact with someone that's talking to them about, you know, extreme views and things like that? You mean like a friend of family is like a risk of, of radicalisation? Like yeah, of radicalisation. Like so if, so if um, someone's talking to you... And, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a pretty obvious thing here in that, like, people's behaviour changes. Um, maybe they're not hanging around with the people they used to. Maybe they um hanging around with someone new. Maybe they're... Um, the main thing is, and, I, and this is hard to sort of quantify, but having a feeling you know when something's changing that person. Um, and trust your gut feeling um, and just sort of speak to someone about it. It might even just be that maybe they're having sort of like a mental health crisis and they need help. Maybe they just need you to check in. Um, we don't know what's going on in someone's head. And we certainly don't know if someone else is filling them with lies. And the only, uh, only way we're going to know about that is if we speak to them, speak to some people around them and try and get a better picture of it. So I think definitely change the behaviour, but also, you know, it, it's okay to be passionate about an issue. It's different when that turns violent, I guess, and that's something to look out for as well. Amazing. And uh, have we got any questions? Yes. Um, how did you mentally recover from people? Oh, I'm sorry. How did you mentally recover? Mentally. So it was difficult, and to be honest with you, um, support really wasn't there. Um, it was really difficult to access, you know, and I guess it's probably the same for anyone who like suffers from mental health. Really difficult to access support from like the NHS and stuff. Um, found that people didn't really understand it, didn't really get what I was going through, and there was this like, I don't know if it's the right phrase, but like a morbid fascination with it, like because it's on the telly and it's, it's in the news, and everyone wants to know everything about it, and everyone you met, like, because I'm from quite a small town, so. You know, the, the local newspapers loved it. It was plastered over the bloody newspaper for like months. And you'd be walking around town and like, it doesn't take much for people to put two and two together that there's a, you know, a ginger herb guy on crutches wandering around town sort of thing. And, and they come over and ask and then everyone wants to know exactly what happened and then you've got to replay everything over and over and over to every single person you meet. And actually all I wanted was, yes, to replay it, but to someone who knew what to say and what to do, like a trained professional, you know? And um, that wasn't always available. What I would say, for me personally, I guess sort of like, like a realisation I had was sort of, I guess just understanding actually and realising that it wasn't unnatural, like I wasn't the freak here. This was a very unnatural thing that happened and it was my body's natural response to that. To be honest with you, I feel a bit more worried actually if someone went through something so horrific and wasn't affected, or at least pretended not to be affected. That's probably the more natural thing. So I think actually um, that sort of realisation that I wasn't the one in the wrong here, there's only one person in the wrong, and he died in that attack, um, kind of, I think, sort of reassured me and it's something that sort of helped me get by through the tough times. But it's one of those things where, you know, it's not, it's not a linear path. There's ups and downs constantly. And that will remain the same, I think, for, for our entire lives. And not just for those affected by terrorism, but anyone who goes through any sort of hardship is it's just getting used to that and knowing your own triggers, knowing how to deal with it, that sort of thing. So I hope that answers it, but a bit of a long-winded answer, so apologies. Anybody else? Yeah, it's a question over So, growing up, did you ever like, see any racist views around you? When I was growing up? Not racism towards me, but yeah, a lot of racism. So I'm from um, Darwin, which uh, is a small town next to Blackburn, Dr. you've heard of Blackburn. Um, Blackburn, I think off the top of my head, it's got maybe like 60% uh, Muslim population. Um, and to be honest, the other 40% is a bunch of racist or white folks usually. Um, so there's a lot of clashes, um, and certainly there were growing up. Um, not like, you know, not, not, not big sort of, I guess, violent clashes as such, but 
like just everyday racism in school and stuff, you know? You'd hear it, you'd see it. Um, I mean, I think if I remember right, like when I was, I think maybe like 14, the, um, what do you call them, EDL, did like a march through Blackburn to try and rile everyone up. And they were marching past mosques and stuff, so yeah, um, certainly wasn't on the receiving end of it because I'll admit it's easier being white, but um, certainly saw it for that way, and it's not nice. Anyone else? No? No questions? One more down here? If you do have any questions and you don't want to stick your hand up, you can just come and ask me at the end. Have you been back to where it happened? Yeah, so it's a good question. I actually went back to the bridge two days after the attack while I was still in hospital. Um, I just wanted to. Bit of a weird thing. Could I just, um, I didn't want to be like um, prevented from, you know, it's Westminster Bridge, it's literally smack bang in the middle of London. You can't watch any films that take place in the UK without seeing it plastered all over it, you know? Whenever someone in a film or a TV show comes to London, it shows Parliament, shows the bridge. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to feel like, um, like I guess you know, sensitive about it. So I went back two days afterwards. Didn't spend long there because you know, obviously people are walking past us and staring at you and things, and it's not. Um, you know, you can't stop a car on the bridge. So obviously, when when the police car that was taking me there stopped in the middle of the bridge, it was obvious people were looking at me. Um, but I've been back loads of times since, and we actually, um, we actually managed to get a plaque installed there uh, last year. And I'll be honest with you, I never, it's something I never struggled with. There are people, and I've met a hell of a lot of people who will full stop and never go back to, never mind the bridge, but never go back to London, full stop. Um, they don't want to deal with it, they're going to avoid it. And, and I guess that's maybe a strategy, an avoidance strategy for dealing with, you know, again, you don't know what's going on in people's minds. That said, that just wasn't something I ever suffered with. I guess from my perspective, and another thing that usually gets asked is, did you suffer from, say, uh, flashbacks? And that's one thing that, again, whenever someone experiences trauma on like, television or something, I think it's the easiest way for the directors to show they've got it, so they show like a flashback. I never experienced that either. Some people have, just wasn't something that I dealt with. For me, sleeping was the big issue. You know, I could, I could control what I thought about during the day, but when I closed my eyes, it's all, you know, it's open season. And that was where for a long time afterwards, I really struggled, struggled getting to sleep, struggled being asleep. Um, and it manifested in like physical ways as well. My leg, obviously, I couldn't, couldn't move it effectively for, um, you know, six months afterwards. And yet it would try and kick out the stuff in my sleep because obviously I was having these horrific dreams and you're quite literally trying to like bloody run away and stuff in your dream. They would cause physical pain as well. Um, I dealt with that for a long time. That was really difficult. And again, that was the one thing that I would go to doctors and say, you know, what can I do? And all that would be offered would be like ridiculous, you know, like drink a cup of warm milk or something or, or here, take these pills. And I didn't want to go down that road because that was avoiding the problem rather than dealing with it. It works for some people, but I don't want to do it. And um, again, long-winded answer, but no, I never had any issue with going back to the bridge, but I know a lot of people do. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple more over here. Uh, and more back there, go Let's go over here first, and then, did you have your hand up at the back as well? Did you have your hand up as well? Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. So I think we've got a few in this corner, haven't we? So. Questions, but, um, can, can you bring a bit closer? Can have you forgiven the parents? Sorry? Have you forgiven the parents? I got asked this on Tuesday as well. It's funny because I never usually get asked this, and then that's twice in, in one week. So um, I get asked this a lot outside of outside of like school talks. It's like it's usually like journalists and stuff that ask me. Um, mm. The answer actually is no. And I know that's sometimes surprising because I think people expect, uh, oh, you've got to forgive them, you've got to forgive them. It's, uh, it's a way of recovering. Um, as far as I'm concerned, he died in the attack, um, you know, and I never, perhaps it would be different if there was a criminal court case and maybe I had to testify or something against him. Um, but I always just thought, he's dead, I'm alive, why should I be the one who has to, you know, go out of my way to forgive someone who, um, quite frankly, I'm not going to benefit from it, and he certainly isn't. So that was my sort of mindset on it. For some people, they do. I mean, I think it's different as well for people who perhaps lose a loved one, because they sometimes, um, 
feel a compulsion to do it so that they can carry on with their lives, and I think it's sort of done in memory of their loved one. But, yeah, everyone's different. For me, I never felt the need to forgive. And question behind you? I don't really thought question. I just want to say that you're a very strong person for being a strong person. Thank you, I appreciate it. Anybody else got a question? Did all of your friends survive in the park? Sorry, I can't quite hear. Did all of your friends survive in the park? Yeah, so, uh, this is something I forgot to mention actually before, but immediately after I was hit by the car and, uh, you know, lined back down the concrete and sort of got up to my feet, we noticed one of the lads in my group was missing. Um, I will say straight off the bat, he wasn't dead, but we didn't know this at the time. Um, people, of course, were shouting someone's been thrown over, someone's landed in the Thames, and we genuinely thought this was him. Um, we looked over, we couldn't see anyone, couldn't see any bodies or anything in the Thames, um, but we had no reason to believe it wasn't him. Where was, where was he? Where did he go? Um, turned out, actually, that he, just, just seconds before the car hit us, was a little bit further back in the, you know, the sort of, I guess, chaos of people walking on the bridge. And where the car had actually hit us head on, the bumper of the car had flown off and like winded him basically, but he was still standing and the actual car hadn't hit him. And in doing so, he broke some ribs, he didn't realise at the time, but all he saw was us, you know, kind of pool of blood on the floor. And I think he just went into shock and he doesn't know what happened for the next like two or three hours. He has no recollection of it whatsoever. But he was found, I mean, you guys are probably familiar, I guess, with sort of central London. Bridge, Westminster Bridge, nowhere near Vauxhall. That's where he was found three hours later. And um, he's walked into a pub covered in blood. And the bartender was like, I'm going to call the police on you. Um, you know what's wrong. And that's when he sort of snapped out of it. Um, but as I said, the police came, interviewed him. He went on a train and he went back home. And he didn't realise he was injured until about two weeks later. He thought he just had a chest infection. But he'd broken his ribs. And it was really about, I guess, 12 hours of not knowing. We just assumed he was dead, full stop, because, as I said, we had no reason not to. That's the awful reality of it. And it was only about, you know, I mean, I, I got to a hospital ward maybe like one in the morning, and the attack happened half two. So that's how long I was in that treatment. Finally got to access my phone, saw a text from him, and he'd made it back home. So he, like everyone else in my group, did survive. We were all injured, um, but, yeah, incredibly lucky again. If you think sort of numbers-wise... Really lucky that actually we all made it through that. So, has anybody else got a question? Or are we come to an end? Yeah, I think if anyone's got any questions that they still want to ask, you can, just come you can ask at the end. But I think that was absolutely amazing, and I'm really inspired by that journey and the resilience that you've shown. I think a round of applause, guys.